you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray that you would strengthen us for worship, strengthen our faith, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and his glory. We pray that you would conform us to his image, that we might be a glory to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That you may stand in the same glory of God. <clears throat>
bless us and provide for us according to your will. As we make our, our journey through this life, we pray that you would watch over us and preserve us, keep us safe from harm, help us to arrive safely in that great heavenly city where Christ is, uh, the one who is our glory. May we rejoice when we see his presence, when we see his glorious face. We pray, O oh Lord, that in this day your spirit be at work in our midst. We pray that you would uh, apply your word to our hearts, strengthen us by our fellowship with one another, move our hearts to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus in the course of life and always to have hope in uh, your great work. We pray, Lord, that you would continue your hand of healing within our congregation. We thank you for the way that you've worked with many. Uh, we pray for Kathy Martin, who is yet unable to attend. We pray that you would bring healing to her, to her leg, and minister to her and John, and take care of them. We thank you that Rhoda has regained sufficient strength to return today. We rejoice in that and pray that you would continue to bring healing and help to her. Give her wisdom as she considers uh, how to deal with her hip. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would help her to make uh, decisions which will provide for her good health for the future. We pray for Bob and Carol Lennon. We thank you for bringing them here today as well. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on them, that they would have strength for each day. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to renew their health and watch over them. I uh, thank you for watching over George and Ella McLaren for the season of good health that they've enjoyed. We pray for your continued care for them. Be with others who are not able to be with us, for Larry Handy and for Eve Thomas, we pray for your love and care to be extended to them. Uh, we thank you for watching over Emmanuel. We thank you for his general good health and pray that you continue to watch over him. Bless him and provide for his every need. We thank you for him and we rejoice in his fellowship with us here. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with those of us who are healthy and strong and able to work. We pray that you would protect us in our places of employment, prosperous in our labors. Pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to provide for our loved ones and for your work here and for the advance of your kingdom around the world. We pray for your blessing on uh, our families. We thank you for uh, the visit of Ian and Rachel last week. We pray for your blessing on them. We pray that you would guide and provide for them. And we pray for uh, the box teams. We pray that you would watch over them and minister to their spiritual needs as well. We thank you, Father, for uh, our church and for being a part of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We pray for his various mission efforts. We thank of the ongoing work in uh, down in town. We pray for David Copeland, that as he opens your word uh, each Sunday, that your blessing would be on that and that you would gather your people in that place. We pray, Lord, that you would bless other church planting efforts across the nation and may they prosper under your hand. We pray that you sustain our missionaries as they serve overseas. We think especially of those who are in Asia uh, in view of uh, the rise of or the threats of conflict there. We pray that you preserve and protect them. Uh, we pray Lord, for your blessing on each one. Bless the church and the believers there in those nations. We pray to you for them that you protect them. Uh, we thank you, O Lord, that you are with your people in the midst of her sufferings. And we pray, O Lord, that you would comfort them, strengthen them, and provide for them in every way. Be with those who serve in the Middle East. We thank you for the Middle East Reformed Fellowship and the broadcasts that go throughout the Middle East. We thank you for those who have come to faith. And we thank you for those who are trained to be pastors uh, in, in that region. And we pray, O Lord, for your continued blessing on them. We pray that you would uh, watch over uh, your distressed church in that region. We pray, O Lord, that you would be their defender. We pray that you strengthen us that we too might defend them as well as we should. We thank you, Father, for the independence that our nation celebrates this weekend. We thank you for uh, the blessing that we've had in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. We thank you for uh, Christian people who have served in government and throughout our nation over the course of its history. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for our many sins, for the way in which we so often stray from your word. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our present administration, President, Congress, Senate, uh, bless our, our courts as well, that we might learn to do that which is right and good. We pray that you would help us to forsake evil, to forsake corruption, forsake false gods, 
Help us, O oh Lord, to honor you, the true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, who, in whom alone is hope and salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our chaplains who serve in our military and serve within Congress as well, and others who serve the members of the Congress in prayer meetings and Bible studies. We pray for your blessing on them. Lead them by your spirit. Guide them by your word. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our country once more. Bless it with a great measure of your spirit's outpouring. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would see many come to faith in Jesus and learn to live before him. So we ask for your blessing in our country, and we thank you for it. We thank you for the many good things that you bless us with in this life. We thank you for this congregation, this place where we can gather together from week to week to worship you and to fellowship with each other. We pray that our fellowship would grow deeper and stronger, that we would grow more and more in Christ's likeness, and that your kingdom would advance throughout this community. We would ask that in all things you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Deuteronomy chapter 18. Verse of books in the Old Testament, the, under the Pentateuch, written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we'll pick up our reading at verse, verse 9. And read to the end of the chapter. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. They shall not be, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who requires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Need not be afraid of it. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, for the message of the scriptures. We thank you for your revelation to Moses of long ago. We thank you that his word continues to speak to us today, not merely of things that occurred in his day, but also of how we too may learn to listen to the prophet that you've given to us. We pray for your blessing on our meditation on your word. May your spirit apply into each heart. May we look to Jesus and trust in him. We pray in his name. Amen. The great American investor Warren Buffett is known by the name of the Oracle of Omaha. He's known that way because of his uh, uncanny insight into the, the direction of the stock markets and in particular certain undervalued stocks that he buys up and uh, in time, they proved to be winners, and he does very well with them. He's amassed a tremendous amount of wealth uh, by his insight into the market. They call him the Oracle of Omaha because it almost seems as though he can see the future when he picks his stocks. And wouldn't you love to be able to see where the market's going to go first before you make your purchases of a share of stock? We've often had an interest in the direction of the future, whether it's for stock investments or wide variety of things. What is God's will for me? Or what is the direction of my life for the future? Who will I marry? Where will I live? What job will I have? Uh, all kinds of questions come before us as we begin life. And as we make our way through life, there are many questions that, as well that continue to come to our minds. Uh, what has happened to those who have passed on before me? Where did they go? May I speak with them? Many kinds of things come to mind when we look at the future and look at our relationship with others, particularly those who have passed on. 
I remember when I was in college, I had read uh, a Greek tragedy called, by Sophocles called Oedipus the King. It's a story of a, a man who becomes king and his community is uh, under a plague and they want to find out why this plague. So the king, Oedipus, consults the oracle and the oracle comes back and says, you've got to find out who murdered the previous king. And so Oedipus goes on this grand search and much to his dismay, there, uh, it, it becomes apparent that he is the one who killed the previous king. And the whole story is about how the, the fates have determined the direction of his life no matter what he does. There was an oracle made about him at his birth, and then an oracle as well made about the king who was killed, and all these things, and suddenly all these things through his research come together, and it becomes apparent that he was, his life was directed in this way. The nations of the world followed this kind of thing. They were governed by fates, they were governed by oracles, they uh, would try to divine what the future would hold. I believe it is in some place where as he, the diviner sees the, the future, uh, he op opens, looks at the entrails of an animal to discern what the future would hold. They also look at the shape of the clouds and the movement of the sky and use them to try to determine what the future might bring. All kinds of different methods to try to discern what the future might be. When God brings Israel to their promised land, he instructs Moses to inform them that when they enter into that land, they're going to encounter these kinds of pagan uh, rituals and the, these pagan uh, efforts to find out the future. And he says, you're not to do what these people are doing because it is an abomination to me. Really what is happening here in, in these various uh, activities is that, that they are getting involved in the occult, in the dark world, the spiritual forces. In the best case, they're misled or confused. In the worst case, they're brought into ever deeper levels of evil. And God instructs his people not to get involved with that. What you find in Deuteronomy 18 is God presents a contrast between the ways that the world seeks to understand itself and its future and the way that God's people should look for guidance in life. And they're from two different sources. For Moses and for the people of God, they are to look to the prophet whom God would send them. And, then, and this prophet would explain to them all that God would have for them. I'm reminded of what Moses would say later on in the 29th chapter of the same book where he says that the things uh, that God has given to us belong to us and to our children forever, but the secret things belong to the Lord. So with that comment, Deuteronomy 29, 29, Moses indicates that there are some things that God's going to reveal to us through his prophets, and those are things that we should treasure, hold on to, use as a guide for life. But God's not going to reveal everything to us. There are some things that we'll keep secret. And this calls for faith, to trust in God and his care for us in the course of life, and his sovereignty over life. Coming back to the 18th chapter, Moses speaks about the, the different kinds of abominations that uh, the Israelites will come across there in the land of Canaan, and all different kinds of ways in which they seek guidance in life. I would note before getting into the details of the, those different approaches, you'll find that first they are an offense to God, so they bring God's judgment. And therefore they're a culture, they bring their culture into disarray and eventual destruction. These are the kinds of things that bring death to a culture. And the description that Moses is going to give here is not something that was unique to that particular time period, but it continues with us today. In fact, you can go up the road and you can find a psychic reader on a corner on 309. You can go in different places and find people who will read tarot cards for you. Or you can open up your newspaper, go online and find your horoscope and these kinds of things. There are people who light candles for the dead and perhaps even pray to the dead. Those kinds of things are what Moses warns us against here. 
Deuteronomy chapter 18. There are three sets of uh, inquiry here that these folks engage in. There is first those who seek to divine the future. Uh, and then there are those who seek to manipulate events, sorcerers and uh, those who are charmers. And then those who try to communicate with the dead, the necromancers and, and so forth. These different uh, 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 approaches to uh, finding guidance and direction in life are things which God forbids his people to engage in. By contrast, Paul, uh, Moses rather, presents a prophet who is yet to come, one who will speak God's word to his people. Note that Moses says, first of all, he's going to come from within your own, among your own people. So he arises from within the covenant community. It does not come from outside that community, such as these abominations that were in the land of Canaan. He comes from within the community. God himself, secondly, will raise him up and place his word in his mouth. And he will say everything that God has taught him to say. With Moses, we have the beginning of a prophetic tradition. In many respects, Moses is the beginning, although I think Abraham is also described as a prophet. But Moses is the beginning, in large measure, of the prophetic tradition. And many of the prophets who follow after him build on the revelation that God has given and apply it to their circumstances in the course of history. I think of Elijah um, and Elisha, and then later on uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, taking God's law and applying it to the people. The law given to Moses. The work of a prophet was not merely to predict the future, although it had a predictive element from time to time. Indeed, right here, Moses makes use of a prediction in foretelling the arrival of this uh, great prophet. But more at the heart of the meaning of the word prophet is one who speaks forth the word of God. One who proclaims that which God has to say. And so it's not merely something that depicts the future, but it's also something which explains how God wants us to live. What we are to believe about God and about ourselves, about the world in which God has made. And so the prophet is one who foretells the word of God. He speaks forth that which God has given to us. Uh, the Hebrew makes use of several words to describe the prophet. Now the is one uh, Jose is a seer, um, someone who uh, looks into the future. You see from time to time that uh, the prophets are called seers, um, not seers in the books, but seers. Uh, God's able to uh, reveal himself in visions and dreams to his prophets. And so the Jose, or uh, the, the other form of the Hebrew word is, is much like that is a seer. Um, God is able to reveal himself in these ways, but you recall that he, he rebuked Miriam and Aaron when they were rebelling against Moses. And he says, To some I speak in visions and dreams, but to my servant Moses I speak face to face as a man does with his friend. There is a closeness and a bond there between God and Moses, a unique relationship there which needs to be respected. So Moses is the foundation of this prophetic tradition which unfolds over the course of time. We find that his prophecy here is fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the great prophet of whom Moses spoke. The apostle Peter himself makes that very explicit in the third chapter of Acts, the book of Acts, after he heals the lame man and he's called upon to give a defense for what has happened. He said that it's in the name of Jesus that this one stands before you, whole. Jesus, the holy and righteous one whom you rejected. He is the one of whom Moses spoke. I will raise up a prophet for you like you from among your brethren, and he will speak that everything that I say. You must listen to him, Peter says. Peter sees that Jesus is the great prophet that Moses spoke of. So what we have here is Jesus as a climax of the prophetic tradition. He is the one of whom all the prophets wrote. 
is the goal and the apex of that prophetic tradition we saw last week in Hebrews chapter 1 that God spoke in a variety of ways and different uh, forms to the prophets of old, but in these last days, He has spoken to us in His Son. There's the exact representation of His nature, the radiance of His glory. It is the Son who now stands before us as the fulfillment of Moses' prediction. He is the great prophet who has come to the church. And in fact, the Apostle Peter will go on to say in his first epistle, in the first chapter, about the 10th verse, or the 12th verse rather, that Jesus is the one who spoke uh, to the prophets of long ago. Peter says that the prophets spoke by the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ was showing them the sufferings of the coming Christ and the glories that would follow. And so what Peter says is that standing behind the Mosaic tradition of prophets was the Spirit of Christ who was speaking to them and through them. In other words, Jesus is both the first and the final prophet. He is the Word of God. Of course, we're reminded of what the Apostle John says in the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John looks at Jesus and says, He is the Word. He is the rationality of God. He is the one who reveals and communicates God to us. If we wish to know God or know anything about God, we must do so through Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. Jesus himself said in Matthew's Gospel, the 11th chapter, he speaks of how um, no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except the Father. He goes on to say that nobody knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son wills to reveal him. If we wish to know God the Father, it must be through the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the one who reveals God to us. Jesus often in his conversations with uh, those who are around him, especially in, in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John, speaks of how he, he speaks that which the Father had given to him. Everything that the Father has given to him, that is what he speaks. That is an echo of what Moses had to say in Deuteronomy 18. I will place my word in him, and he will speak all that I command him. Jesus is fulfilling his mission in revealing all that the Father has to give to us. Now, it is here that we come across a challenge from the modern world particularly mainline Protestantism and those who are skeptical of the supernatural origins of Scripture, who doubt uh, the claims of Christ, or at least the claims of the church about Christ. Uh, there are many today who try to say that Jesus of Nazareth was a historical figure of long ago, but he was just an ordinary rabbi. We know a handful of things about him, but not really much. What has happened after Jesus is that the church has come by and they've taken Jesus, something of a, a, a country hero, and they, they blown him up into the Christ. They've exalted him into a son of God. They've made him an object of worship. And they've encrusted him with all kinds of doctrines and theologies that uh, benefit the church. And so in modern theology, there's been this great separation between the church and Jesus Christ. But the scriptures make clear that that cannot be held consistently. Jesus himself says that when he rises from the dead, he will send his spirit, the spirit of truth, and he will teach them all that God would have for them. So the spirit would take the things of Christ and reveal them to the apostles. Jesus commissioned the apostles and gave them authority to proclaim his word. So Jesus himself recognized that there would be additional revelations beyond that which he gave to them while walking with them uh, throughout Galilee. With his ascension into heaven, he arises and enters into a new stage uh, of his ministry. In 
theology, we talk of the two states of the Lord Jesus. His state of humiliation on the earth, where he served as a prophet in this world, rejected by his people, followed by a small gathering of his disciples, and then his exaltation, his state of exaltation, where by in heaven, he continues to speak to his church. He continues to be the final prophet of the church, even though we have revelations on the apostles James and uh, uh, Peter and, and John and, and Paul and so forth. It is Jesus speaking to his church through these apostles. These were sent by him to reveal God's will. And so the apostles were very much aware that they spoke from Christ. Words which Christ had given to them. They spoke the gospel that comes from heaven itself. Right to the Hebrews, as we saw last time in the second chapter of the first verse, it says, How shall we neglect? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation that was confirmed by those who heard with signs and wonders and so forth? God has spoken powerfully in his son. So we should listen to him. He is the final prophet of the church. We come to this one who then speaks to us through his word. He takes that word and he continues to speak today. In indirect means, through his word and through the preaching of that word from Sunday to Sunday, as his word is faithfully proclaimed, Jesus continues to speak to us. He calls us to repent of our sins. He calls us to believe in Him, to follow after Him. He continues to be the great prophet of the church, calling us to His eternal home. And so will you listen to this Jesus and hear from Him? There are many false prophets who have gone out into the world today. There are many who claim to have revelations from God. You have Muhammad, the prophet, who claimed to have revelations from God and Reveal these things to his followers. You have um, Joseph Smith receiving revelations from Nairobi, the angel, and revealing them to uh, the Mormons and the Mormon people following after these revelations, which is a, a, a reassertion of pagan uh, beliefs under the, the, the uh, uh, garb of Christianity. These false prophets need to be rejected. We need to be alert to them. They may inhabit various religious beliefs like that, or they may be in pulpits where they do not proclaim the Word of God, but take humanistic ideas and incorporate them into their sermons and make use of pop psychology rather than the clear teaching of Scripture to address the, heal, the hurts and pains of God's people. The Word of God is our sole source of life and truth. We need to follow after that. In fact, the Apostle Paul, I think, makes it clear that the Word of Christ is that which explains everything all around us. We cannot know anything apart from the Word of Christ. Now, we have that given to us in Scripture, but also in all general revelation, that too is the Word of Christ. Remember, the writer to the Hebrews, as we considered last time, said that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. The Gospel of John, the first chapter, says that in him was life, and the light was the light of men. Those commentators consider that to be the way in which Christ illumines the minds of many to understand a certain measure of truth, even in their darkness, even in their sin. Christ is the light of the world. If you wish to know anything, it actually comes through Jesus Christ. And so the laws of science, are they just really the result of material relationships, physical relationships, gravity, and so forth? These laws are reflections of the word of Christ, ruling and operating over all. And so we can have a, a wide vision of the word of Christ governing all of life. And we need to explore and seek to understand what Christ is saying to us. And we need to discipline our minds to listen to what Christ says in all things. But certainly scripture is that 
the location where it is most clear, God most clearly speaks to us, infallibly and inerrantly, so that we might know who God is, who we are, and how we must relate to Him. And so rather than consulting in spirits, seeking gurus, trying to discern what the future might hold for us, and all these many things, let's turn to the Scriptures, Go to God's Word and seek to understand what God has to say to us. Live in the light of Jesus Christ, the true prophet of the church, and follow Him. We don't need any other prophets. Jesus is the first. He is the final prophet. He is the Word of God. And in Him, O Christ, let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, which speaks to us of all of life especially directs us with authority that we might listen to him. We pray that as he commands all men everywhere to repent, we pray that we would heed his word, repenting of our sins and turning to him in faith, trusting in his promise of forgiveness and everlasting life. And we pray, O oh God, that you would bless these words to our hearts, that we might proclaim that we have a great prophet for the church, even Jesus our Lord. In his name we pray. Let's respond to the ministry of the Word of God by bringing you through the Word of our morning times and morning times.
for you once more the words of institution for the Lord's Supper. Our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper as an ordinance to be observed by His church until He comes again. It is not a re-sacrificing of Christ, but is a remembrance of the once for all sacrifice of Himself in His death for our sins. Nor is it a mere memorial to Christ's sacrifice. It is a means of grace by which God feeds us with the crucified, resurrected, exalted Christ. He does so by His Holy Spirit and through faith. Thus He strengthens us in our warfare against sin and in our endeavors to serve Him in holiness. The sacrament further signifies and seals the forgiveness of our sin and our nourishment and growth in Christ. The bread and wine represent the crucified body and the shed blood of the Savior which He gave for His people. In this sacrament, God confirms that He is faithful and true to fulfill the promises of His covenant. And He calls us to deeper gratitude for our salvation, to renewed consecration, and to more faithful obedience. The Supper is also a bond and pledge of the communion that believers have with Him and with each other as members of His body. As Scripture says, For we being many are one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. The scripture anticipates the consummation of the ages, when Christ returns to gather all his redeemed people at the glorious wedding feast of the Lamb. As we come to the Lord's table, we humbly resolve to deny ourselves, to crucify the sin that is within us, to resist the devil to follow Christ as becomes those who bear his name. As we approach the table, we're reminded that we must repent of our sins and rest in Jesus Christ alone. Let's approach the table now and turn to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing upon this communion meal. Let's pray. Father, we pray that your spirit would bless us as we gather before this communion meal. We thank you that Christ, by his spirit, is present with these elements, and we pray that as we take this bread and drink of this cup, we would feed spiritually on Christ, the one who was crucified and, and died for us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us for our many sins. We confess them to you this day, and pray that you would wash them all away through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We rest only in him. We pray, O oh Lord, that your blessing will be on us as we gather by your Spirit, to eat by faith. We pray that you would strengthen us in grace that we might serve you more faithfully in the days, weeks, and years to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.